If you are just joining us, my name is Andrea Bassing Matney, and I am the Community Outreach Programs and Support Specialist for Research Services at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. A few quick notes before we start. We have allotted 10 minutes at the end of the talk for questions and answers. You may submit your question via speak to the speaker via Twitter using hashtag GenFair2014. For captioning, go to the Virtual Genealogy Fair website and click on the link for today. The lectures will be recorded and posted on the website by the end of November. Lecture number 10 is entitled, Immigration and Naturalization Service, Exclusion and Deportation Files at the National Archives, and our speaker is Zach Wilski. Do you have an immigrant ancestor who was held on Ellis Island? An old family story about a relative who was sent back to the old country? If so, there may be a record at the National Archives. This presentation will use case study examples to introduce family historians to immigration and naturalization service exclusion and deportations files, 1893 to 1950, now at the National Archives. Viewers will hear tips for determining if a record may exist, learn the best way to search for exclusion and deportation files, and see example files from immigrants eventually admitted, excluded, or deported. Zach is the historian for U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. I am pleased to introduce Zach Wilski, and I'm turning the microphone over to Zach. Thank you so much. Thanks, and uh, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, tuning in. As Andrea mentioned, my name is Zach Wilski, and I'm the historian for USCIS, or U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. I'm just mentioning that again because I am a historian at USCIS. I'm presenting today at the National Archives, and I'm going to be discussing records that are now stored at the National Archives, but I actually work for USCIS, and I'm going to mention our USCIS genealogy program. And to access that program, you're going to have to go to our website rather than the National Archives website. So my topic for today are INS deportation and exclusion files that are now stored at the National Archives. Uh, we're going to do four things. First, we're going to go over a few important things to know. Then we're going to uh, look at the two most important tools for finding the files. Then we're going to do the exciting stuff, which is look at some sample files. And finally, uh, hopefully, we'll have time for a few questions. So first, uh, the important things you need to know about exclusion and deportation files. Uh, a couple of definitions that are important. First, exclusion files refer to uh, files that relate to the refusal, refusal of admission by a Board of Special Inquiry at the port of entry. So these are uh, immigrants who were refused admittance when they tried to enter the country as immigrants. Deportation files refer to, refer to files that relate to the removal of an alien already in the United States. So this is somebody who's entered the United States eager, either legally or non-legally and is later removed from the United States. Uh, at the USAIS History Office, we get lots of questions about deportation records, and about 90% of those actually relate to exclusion files or files related to a BSI hearing at a port of entry. Uh, now I'm going to disappoint a lot of people right away and say that not all deportation and exclusion, exclusion records still survive. Um, if the event occurred after 1892, though, there is a chance that a record may still exist. The 1892 date is important because in 1891, the federal government began uh, overseeing immigration. Uh, so before that, there are no federal immigration records. You won't find anything at the National Archives from the Immigration Service before 1891 because it didn't exist. Second, uh, exclusion files exist only for cases that were appealed to INS headquarters in Washington, D.C., and those were only a small percentage of the total number of cases. Uh, unfortunately, the Immigration Service long ago made the decision to destroy local files, so files that were actually stored at the port of entry, and so we only have copies for those cases that were appealed to Washington, D.C. and are now stored at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Deportation files exist for warrants issued between 1903 and 1944. Uh, deportations happened before and after that, of course, but they were, they're in separate records, records that we're not going to discuss today, uh, and that relates to my final point here which is that exclusion and deportation files may have been consolidated into other INS files, especially in the later years, uh, once we get closer to 1944. For any immigrant who remained in the United States after 1944, there's a chance that these kinds of uh, exclusion and deportation files would have been pulled forward into an INS alien or A file, which is another topic for another presentation. 
Uh, a couple other things you need to know about the files we're talking about today. Um, all or most of the files we're talking about today are from Record Group 85 at the National Archives. Record Group 85 are the records of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. And within Record Group 85, they're part of Entry 9, which are the Immigration Policy and Correspondence Files, 1906 to 1956. I've got the uh, archives identification information on the slide below that. Um, I'm not sure how the archives uses those numbers, but I know that if I request a file from Record Group 85, Entry 9, I normally get the file that I need. How do I find a file I need? Uh, there's two finding aids that you need to know about. The first is the subject index to correspondence and case files of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, which is the National Archives microfilm publication T458 and has been digitized and put online by Ancestry.com. And second, uh, the USCIS genealogy program index search request. And I'm going to talk more about those in detail now. So first is the subject index to INS correspondence and case files, which again is the National Archives microfilm publication T458. It's got over 200 index cards on the, film, uh, 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 on the microfilm. If you average about uh, five entries per card, that's over a million entries in that index. Uh, on the slide here, we've got a sample index card. Uh, the index is a subject index, so of course uh, the cards are arranged by subject. On the upper left-hand corner of each card, you'll see the subject of the card. In this case, we see the uh, subject SS Agate, but this file uh, or this card is actually part of a larger subject uh, called Vessels by Name, and within that, it's a list of ship names alphabetically. Uh, so SS Agate is one of the first ships that appears under the heading Vessels by Name. Uh, below the subject, you normally find the files. These are what uh, entry nine files look like. Uh, they normally begin with the number 50,000 to 56,000, and then there's a dash or a slash, and then a second number. Uh, to request a file, you need both parts of that file. So you need the 50,000 number and the subsequent part, a two or three digit number after the dash or the slash. The dash and the slash uh, uh, don't mean anything different. They refer to the same file. Uh, in the main body of the card, of course, you'll find the file subject. In this case, they all relate to passengers aboard the SS Agate. And in the upper right-hand corner, you'll find a date for the card. Uh, the card date normally gives you a good idea about the, uh, the date of, the of each correspondence that's listed on the card. Um, but some cards, especially for ships that were uh, less uh, well-traveled, could cover several years. So occasionally, you'll see separate dates for each entry on the card. Um, now, on the bottom, I've, I've mentioned that while well, this index includes names, the index is a subject index, so not all names are included in the index. And here we have an example. Um, the third file listed on the card here mentions fi uh, Finnish crew members aboard the SS Agate, and it says that there's a, a file related to parole of these Finnish crew members. That could be related to 5, 10, or 15 different crew members, and none of them are listed here by name. But if we knew that the immigrant we were looking for was aboard that ship at about that date, we could still request a file and scan it for the name of the person we're looking for. Uh, a few years ago, the subject index of correspondence and case files was made much more accessible when Ancestry.com digitized the index and keyed all of the names that appear in the index, making it name searchable for entries with names. Uh, so you can find this, um, you know, you can search this at home uh, to get your file number, but unfortunately the files themselves have not been digitized, they're still in Washington, D.C., so to get the actual file, you're going to need to come to the National Archives or contact the National Archives. Here we see uh, the same card we looked at on the previous slide for the SS Agate. We see uh, the bottom entry there for Rolf Cedarquist, and we see the equivalent entry in Ancestry.com. Again, this comes up because Rolf's name is actually listed in the index, but any one of those 10 to 15 Finnish crew members from the file above it wouldn't come up because their name is not listed in the subject index. So it's important to keep in mind that while Ancestry.com has made the index name searchable, it's truly a subject index and not everybody appears in the index by name. That's why the second tool for finding exclusion and deportation files is important, and that is the USCIS Genealogy Program Index Search. Uh, the USCIS Genealogy Program, so again, this is uh, USCIS, a separate agency from the National Archives, and USCIS maintains a name index to historical immigration and naturalization records. Uh, this index includes references to the case and correspondence files that are now at the National Archives as part of Entry 9 of Record Group 85. 
This name index includes many of the names not found in the subject index on Ancestry.com. So any of those uh, Finnish crew members that I mentioned we could be listed by name in this index, even though they're not listed in the subject index. So normally what we tell people, if they have a good idea or they believe that the immigrant that they're researching has an exclusion or deportation file, they should first search the subject in index on Ancestry.com. And if they get no results, they can then make a genealogy or an index search request with the USCIS genealogy program. Uh, the index itself is not online and publicly searchable. That's because the index includes references to living people. And so uh, we can't place it online to let the public search it because that would violate privacy restrictions. But we still wanted to make these uh, records accessible to genealogists. So what we've done is allowed people to request that we search the index for them. Uh, there is a fee for the index search. You would submit uh, 20, the $20 fee along with the name, date of birth, that could be approximate, and country of origin for the in immigrant in which you're interested in. And we would search our historical indexes um, for any of the historical records that are included in the genealogy program. That includes the uh, deportation and exclusion files we're talking about today that are now stored at the National Archives, but also several other types of files that are still in USCIS possession, including naturalization certificate files, alien registration records, and visa files. Um, to learn more about the program, the best, way, the best thing to do would be to go to our website, which is uscis.gov slash genealogy. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the presentation. So how would you know if, a if an exclusion file may exist for the immigrant that you're researching? Uh, the big clue is on the passenger manifest notation. So if you're on Ancestry.com or another uh, online uh, research site and you've uh, located your ancestor on a passenger manifest, uh, you can scan to the left of the manifest and look for an SI notation, a BSI notation, or a big X in the left-hand column. Any of those notations normally mean that that immigrant was held for a Board of Special Inquiry hearing, or a hearing to decide whether or not he or she should be excluded from the United States. In this case, our example is Sal Tarika. Uh, you can see her name highlighted there in red, and to the far left, uh, there is an SI notation. It's that uh, sort of big black blob that's been blown up and a stamp that says admitted next to it. So right away, we know that Saul was held for a Board of Special Inquiry hearing and that she was eventually admitted. That's what the admitted stamp tells us. Now, when I see that, the first thing I do is scroll to the end of the passenger manifest and look for the record of aliens held for a Board of Special Inquiry. This is a list of every alien aboard that ship that was held for a hearing to decide whether or not they should be excluded from the United States. Um, it's normally at the end of uh, the manifest, especially for New York lists at Ellis Island. Here we see Saul Tarika's name on the manifest, or on the, the list of aliens held for BSI. And we can see um, from the part that's blown up there that she was held because she's unable to, to read, and she's LPC, which stood for likely to become a public charge. At the time, both of those things could have excluded her from the United States. But as I mentioned, only records for files that were appealed still exist. So what are some good clues that Saul had an appeal hearing? One clue would be to look into the, in the column for departmental and executive orders. And if there's a notation for a departmental or executive order, there's a good chance that, that this decision was made at uh, INS headquarters in Washington, DC. And there's a file at the archives in Washington, DC today. So here we see that there's a decision uh, to land or to admit uh, Saul on 831. Another good clue, sometimes there's no notation in the departmental or executive orders column. But another good clue is to scan all the way to the right-hand side of the uh, BSI hearing list and look in the meals column. Uh, somebody who has a large number of meals in the meals column was held on Ellis Island for a long time. This normally means that that person was awaiting the decision for their BSI hearing. So in this case, we can see that uh, Saul had 19 breakfasts, 20 dinners, and 19 suppers at Ellis Island, which means she was there for 20 days. That's a good clue that a file should exist. Uh, with those clues, I would first search the, an, the, uh, na the subject index on Ancestry.com. Uh, in doing so, uh, we got lucky in this case, and we find that there is a file for Sal Tarika in the subject index. Uh, the name's spelled a little differently, but the date of arrival and the ship are the same, so we know it's here. And you can see on the card uh, that file 54866-618 uh, refers to Sal Tarika. We could take that number to the National Archives, and we'd get back uh, a standard uh, exclusion file with a transcript of her BSI hearing and uh, the results of the decision. We'll see some more sam we'll see some samples like that in a couple of seconds. Um, I have two notes here. 
Um, the first is that manifest notations do not exist, and it should say for all exclusion files. Um, today we're focusing on uh, clues that are on, manifest are on manifest, but we know that some exclusion files exist, and for some reason the Immigration Service never put a notation on the manifest itself. And second, unfortunately, there's no system of notations for, or for de deportations. So if an immigrant is removed at a later date, uh, rather than being excluded upon arrival, there's probably going to be no notation on the manifest itself. Uh, but a good clue for uh, deportation records is that before 1924, there was a time limit. Uh, most immigrants cannot be de deported after three years in the country. So if you know the immigrant first arrived in 1920, the record should, should appear between 1920 and 1923. That changes in 1924, unfortunately, and those time limits begin to go away. So now we're going to get to the fun stuff and look at a few sample cases. Um, our first sample comes from August of 1941, actually, and it relates to Bertha Wertheimer, who arrived on the uh, city of Seville. I'll save you my Spanish pronunciation. Uh, you can see her, name, or her manifest listing highlighted in red there. Um, and you can see blown up there that uh, next to her name, next to Bertha's name, there's a notation. Uh, on the right in the circle there, you'll see an SI. It's a little bit hard to read. And then next to it, a notation that says paroled. So from this page in the manifest, we know that uh, Bertha uh, was held for a, a BSI hearing and eventually paroled into the United States. Because we know that, we would scan back in the manifest until we find the record of aliens held for a, a special inquiry. Uh, and we can see that uh, Bertha appears on the BSI list. Here's her name, again, hi highlighted in red. And there's all kinds of notations next to her name. Uh, in the column for notes on the cause of hearing, two things stand out. The first, and it's difficult to read, but that first little red arrow shows that Bertha's being held because she didn't have a valid visa. So beginning in 1924, any immigrant who wanted to enter the United States had to present a valid visa. Apparently, when she arrived, uh, Bertha didn't have one. Second thing that stands out is that she appealed her case. On the second red arrow there, you can see a notation that says appealed. And of course, we know that if the case was appealed, it's just likely going to be a file at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. The third thing that stands out is a file number. Um, unfortunately, it's a file number that begins with the number 9. Uh, that's usually a local Ellis Island file. Those files were destroyed years ago. So that's not a file number that we can use to, to request um, exclusion files from the National Archives. We need a 56,000 number um, from the correspondence series that I mentioned earlier. Two other clues, of course. Uh, similar to our first example, uh, in the departmental decisions column, there's a note that sh there was a departmental decision made to patrol or parole Bertha uh, in 1941. And then in the meals column, she was there for nine days, it looks like, which isn't an extraordinarily long amount of time. But on top of all these other notation, it indicates that there's probably an exclusion file for Bertha at the National Archives. So I would search uh, the T458 index. Um, the first thing I would probably do is search on microfilm or search on ancestry.com under her name. If we did that, Bertha is listed by name uh, in the index. So she would come up on ancestry.com. You can see the entry uh, on the lower part of the slide there. But you could also search the microfilm itself under the subject vessels by name and then the name of the ship, in this case, the city of Seville, and the date of arrival, in this case, um, in 1941. I bring that up because uh, if you look right before or right underneath Bertha's entry there, um, there is a file below that that mentions an investigation of alleged excessive fees charged to passengers that were on the ship. Uh, and that file uh, actually includes uh, testimony from dozens of immigrants aboard the ships, none of whom are listed by name in the index. So if you knew that you were searching for one of those people and you didn't find them in the name index, it might be worth it to pull that file anyway to see if they're in the file itself. So, but we're looking for Bertha today. So she's uh, listed there with file 56088 slash 958. So we can take that number to the National Archives and request it. If we do that, uh, we get back uh, sort of a standard uh, form in these exclusion files, which is a transcript of her Board of Special Inquiry or BSI hearing, in this case uh, at Ellis Island in August of 1941. Uh, in the BSI hearing, uh, explains why she's being excluded or why she's being, uh, why there's a hearing to determine if she's admissible. And in this case, she's being excluded because her visa expired while she was waiting to ship. 
1941, the city of Seville was actually one of the last passenger ships to get out of Europe during World War II. Um, so Bertha had a uh, valid visa, but uh, she had a ticket aboard another ship. That ship couldn't sail, so she was able to get aboard the city of Seville at the last minute. It sailed, but it sailed after many delays, and during those delays, her visa unfortunately expired, making her inadmissible. Uh, so she explains all of that in her testimony here, and she also explained that she knew her visa was expired, but that the shipping company allowed her to uh, travel anyway as long as she was willing to give them a deposit that was equal to the fine they would have to pay if she was excluded from the United States. She was willing to do that, and she sailed aboard the ship. Uh, with that information, though, the Immigration Service decided that Bertha was an excludable immigrant and that she should not be allowed admission into the United States. Uh, Bertha, of course, appealed that decision. We know that because we see the big stamp uh, appeal at the bottom of the paper there, but also because if she didn't appeal, this file would not exist today because when she appealed, the file was sent to Washington, D.C., where it's now at the National, where it was retired and now it's at the National Archives. Uh, in Washington, D.C., the Immigration Service headquarters agreed with the decision to exclude Bertha. Um, she didn't have a valid visa, therefore she was excludable, but they said that due to world conditions, uh, she shouldn't be required to return to Europe at this time, and instead they decided to parole her for six months on a $1,000 bond. So if she could put up $1,000 promising to come back in six months, she would be allowed in the country. Um, but during that time, they said she should be able to arrange for a valid visa, exit the country, probably go to Canada, and return as a legal immigrant. Um, there's a formal piece of paperwork that goes with this, but I always like when you can see in the file sort of the handwriting that lets you know that a human being made this decision uh, at some point. So Bertha gets in for six months, and unfortunately during those first six months, she's not able to get a valid visa. So what she does is file an application to extend her stay in the United States. This is what that application looks like. Uh, I included this just to demonstrate that these exclusion files uh, include information not just about the date of arrival and the immediate uh, time around that, but they can extend months, uh, years even into the future while the immigrant is uh, having their immigration status straightened out. Uh, finally, after a couple more extensions of her stay, Bertha's able to arrange for a visa. So what she does is file an application for pre-examination, which means she's going to be examined to um, enter as an immigrant, and then she'll travel to Canada, and then cross the border with a valid visa, and then she'll be a legal permanent resident in the United States. This is what the application looks like. This is part of the exclusion file. Uh, if you're lucky enough to find one of these in a file for one of your relatives, you get all kinds of good information. In this case, uh, Bertha was required to provide the uh, cities in which she lived uh, for every year since her birth, and also lots of information about her family, including her mother's maiden name and the village in which she was born and the date of birth. Um, so this is an extensive 10-page form. Gives all kind of biographical information. Uh, once Bertha is able to get that visa, she travels to Canada, crosses the border in Detroit, and presents it. Um, that's what that top excerpt says. And then to, uh, to facilitate that process, the Immigration Service issued her an ID card to help her cross the border. And when she came back into the US as a legal immigrant, she surrendered that ID card. And so it's part of the file as well. And here we get a nice picture of Bertha. And finally, uh, I included this document, which is a uh, refund uh, for her at a ticket, uh, ticket fare. And that's because uh, her, and you can see um, this here, uh, when she enters again in 1943, that's two years after her initial arrival in the United States. So this file covers 1941 to 1943. And after all of this, um, because Bertha was actually excludable in her initial 1941 admission uh, at Ellis Island, she's able to get a refund for her ticket because the uh, shipping company is required under the immigration laws at the time to refund her ticket price for bringing her to the United States knowing she was inadmissible. I included this because lots of people are sometimes surprised to find that the deportation file related to their immigrant ancestor is uh, three-fourths correspondence between the immigration service and the shipping company arguing over who should pay the fine. And finally, uh, of course, all of this uh, happened because Bertha didn't have a valid visa to get in the United States. If we had done a USCIS genealogy program index search, in addition to the file number for that exclusion file, 
the index search would have included a citation for her visa file, and you could have requested that visa file from the USCIS genealogy program. This is a record that's not at the uh, National Archives. It's still in USCIS custody, but we can provide it to you through our genealogy program. So our second example relates to Alfredo Corridori, who arrived in Baltimore in 1920. And I picked this example just to uh, demonstrate that not every port of entry did same things the same as they did in Ellis Island. In this case, uh, in Baltimore, you'll often find a manifest page that looks like this. It'll have just one immigrant listed, and then you'll see a notation that that immigrant was excluded for a border special inquiry hearing, and it gives the date. And then you see below the cause of exclusion. In this case, Alfredo was a stowaway. Uh, he was not listed on the manifest and had no arrival records. Uh, I searched Ancestry.com for Alfredo. Uh, I found some names that were similar, but none that were the same. So because I didn't find any uh, results on Ancestry.com, I decided to make a USCIS index search request. And that returned, among other citations, a citation for a correspondence file. The correspondence file is dated 1919. Uh, he arrived in early 1920. So this file probably relates to that uh, BSI hearing in Baltimore. I could take that file number to the National Archives and request it. And again, I would get back a file that looks like this. Uh, the first thing you see is a copy of the BSI hearing transcript. In this case, it's at the immigration station in Baltimore. Uh, it mentions that Alfredo here is a stowaway and likely to become a public charge. And also that he doesn't have a valid passport visa by an American council. Uh, in 1920, people weren't required to have visas but immigrants from some countries were required to have their passports visa before they left for the United States. Uh, Italy was one of those countries, and unfortunately, Alfredo didn't have a visa passport. So in the testimony, uh, Alfredo reveals several things. First of all, that he had lived in the United States before, um, but while he was here, he had heard so much about Italy that he decided he needed to go back and visit it. When he got back there, he decided that he liked the United States, I think he says, 15 times better than Italy, so he decided he had to come back to the US. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't have a valid uh, passport, so he decided to uh, come back to the US as a stowaway. Uh, another thing that he uh, mentions in his testimony is that he first arrived in, he thinks, 1908 in Philadelphia, so that's good information if we wanted to look for that original passenger manifest from his first arrival. Uh, because Alfredo didn't have a valid passport with a visa, the Immigration Service uh, unanimously, unanimously decided he should be excluded from the United States. But of course, Alfredo says he's going to appeal that decision uh, at once. And so because there's an appeal, we know that there should be uh, this correspondence file at, uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, in addition to Alfredo's testimony, some of his relatives actually come to the immigration station and vouch for him and say they're willing to take care of him if he's admitted into the country. In this case, his brother-in-law comes and says that he owns a farm and he's willing to have Alfredo work there until he can get up on his own two feet. And during his testimony, he mentions that he's a US citizen and even gives his naturalization certificate number. Uh, that's important because if you're interested in documenting uh, all of Alfredo's family, including his brother-in-law, you could take that uh, certificate number and make a records request with the USCIS genealogy program and request a copy of the naturalization certificate and uh, the other paperwork associated with it. So this is a copy of Alfredo's brother-in-law's naturalization certificate. Again, this is not part of Alfredo's file. It's not a file that's at the National Archives. You would need to use that number to request this naturalization certificate file from the USCIS genealogy program. Uh, this is just an excerpt from his appeal. He probably did this verbally. It was transcribed at the immigration station. But he says he doesn't see why he shouldn't be permitted to land in the United States, because he lived here from 1907 to 1919. Uh, he was in the draft. He didn't say he served, but he worked on Hog Island Shipyard during the war. And he's willing to become a citizen at once. In addition, uh, he has relatives in the United States that are willing to take care of him. And for those reasons, he doesn't see why he shouldn't be admitted. Uh, this is actually good enough for the immigration service. They say, we agree, we think that he should be admitted, but the State Department has to agree to waive those passport requirements. So the Immigration Service is going to, to let him in uh, under immigration law. The State Department needs to waive the passport's requirements. Unfortunately for Alfredo, the Immigration Service contacts the State Department, who issues uh, those visa passports. And the State Department says that we're pretty strict about those things, and we don't think it's going to be possible to waive the passport requirement. 
And in fact, uh, they issue a decision. Uh, here's the chief of the visa office in Baltimore that says, we're unwilling to waive the visa passport requirement for Alfredo, so therefore he needs to be deported. So uh, on top of the file, we see this, which is the um, report of the deportation, and we see that Alfredo was actually sent back to Italy uh, aboard the Sori on March 27th of 1920. Uh, just so you don't worry too much about Alfredo, he actually does make it back to the United States. Uh, and here we see an index injury showing his 1947 naturalization. So he eventually made good on his promise to become a U.S. citizen. If we uh, made that USCIS index search through the genealogy program, this uh, file number would have come back along with his original exclusion file number. And so we could have requested the exclusion file from the National Archives and made a records request to USCIS to get a copy of the naturalization file. Our third example for an exclusion file is Edward Dorkins. Uh, Edward is the kind of immigrant that uh, every uh, family historian hopes to find in their family. He seems to have had an exciting life. He witnessed some historic events, and he did lots of paperwork. So this is Al Al or Edward's uh, passenger manifest from the Carpathia in April of 1912. And the Carpathia is actually the ship that picked up the survivors of the Titanic disaster uh, in the mid-Atlantic and brought them to New York. So this manifest was created aboard the Carpathia as it was traveling back to New York with the uh, Titanic survivors. Uh, Edwards had listed on the, uh, the manifest here. You can see it highlighted in red and then blown up on the top. And you see there's a notation in the occupations column. A lot of people assume that these notations refer to some event that has to do with the arrival in 1912. But in this case, a notation in the uh, occupations column normally has to do with a later verification of arrival. You can see there in the red circle, uh, the last number there is actually the date. So some, for some reason, in April of 1941, somebody verified that Alfred, or Edward Dorkins was aboard the Carpathia. Normally this has to do with some sort of application, usually an application for citizenship. So that could point to another file, but for today's purposes, it doesn't point towards an exclusion or a deportation file. Uh, like a surprising number of the Titanic passengers, Edward did not give up on sea travel after uh, the 1912 disaster. In fact, he made his living uh, as a, a crew member aboard ships. So he's got lots of um, entry records on Ancestry.com. He's coming in, uh, in and out of the country constantly. Uh, in fact, we see that uh, in October 1912, he's already re-entering from Blaine, Minnesota. So he left uh, sometime between April and October and came back already once. Among all of those entries and exits, uh, one thing that stands out to me is a 1927 manifest index card. It stands out to me because it includes this notation, which is a BSI notation. So similar to those manifest notations, uh, this card shows that uh, in 1927, Edward was held for a Board of Special Inquiry hearing. Uh, that manifest notation relates to this which is an outgoing passenger manifest for Honolulu. We don't have outgoing passenger manifests for many ports. We have them for uh, Honolulu. And this shows that he actually was deported or actually was excluded from the United States uh, in May of 1927. That tells me that I should look for additional records. In this case, I search Ancestry.com in the subject index, and I don't find any records related to Edward Dorkins. Uh, so then I make a, a USCIS genealogy program index search request. And I do come back with a file number for file 55579 uh, slash 209 from 1927. That's the year that we have the deportation record. So we know it probably relates. We take that file to the National Archives. And here we see another exclusion appeal file. Again, uh, the most important document in the file is the transcript of the BSI hearing. Uh, in this case, Alfred again, uh, like Alfredo, or Edward, like Alfredo, was uh, excluded because he was a stowaway. He had no uh, arrival record. He didn't appear on the manifest. Uh, he mentions uh, that he came over on the Titanic in 1912. And he makes a mistake that a lot of immigrants made, and today lots of genealogists makes, or make. And he says that he served in the US Army, and therefore he claims to be a US citizen. Of course, serving in the US Army didn't make anybody a citizen automatically. There were laws passed to make it easier for members of the military to become citizens, but they still had to naturalize. Unfortunately for Edward, he never uh, did that. 
So in the course of the BSI hearing, uh, the immigration officers asked Edward how he came to be aboard this ship without any uh, uh, documentation. And he says that he left from Liverpool to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, he went to Shanghai. While he was in Shanghai, he got up to drinking. He met some sailors. They went out, and the next thing he knew, he woke up and found himself on a ship out to sea. So Edward was literally shanghai in Shanghai and ended up aboard this ship in Hawaii not knowing how he got there. Uh, that's not good enough for the Immigration Service. They deem him inadmissible because he doesn't have any valid entry papers and also because they think he's likely to become a public charge. And of course, uh, Edward appeals this decision. Unfortunately, oh, well, this is the transmission of the appeal. So this is what the uh, immigration officer in Hawaii would have sent to Washington, D.C., uh, accompanied with a copy of the transcript. In D.C., they would have made a decision. In this case, they decided that Edward's story wasn't good enough to allow him to be admitted. So he's ordered deported, and we see the execution of deportation here and the fact that he was deported on June 2nd of 1927. Interesting thing about Edward is that um, even though he's uh, born in England, living in the United States, because he got aboard that ship in Shanghai, he's actually deported back to Shanghai where the, they're going to let him off. Uh, but Al, uh, Edward doesn't stay down for very long. Um, these are not part of his INS deportation file, but just to give you an idea of where he goes after they drop him off in Shanghai, by August of 1927, Edward's already on a boat coming back into the United Kingdom. And two years later, somehow, he's back in the United States and signing on as a crew member in Port Isabel, Texas, aboard another ship. The next we see of him, and again, this is not part of the INS file, he's in uh, Los Angeles, living in the Home for Disabled Vets in 1933. So although he never became a citizen through his military service, he's at least getting some benefits from that service. And finally, we see his uh, alien registration record from 1940. In 1940, every alien residing in the United States was required to register. Uh, this file is not at the National Archives. It's uh, still with USCIS, but if you made an index search for L Edward Dorkins, in addition to that exclusion file number, you would have got the file number for this alien registration record. Uh, he talks about where he's living in 1940. He's still in Los Angeles. And the interesting thing about Edward is that uh, he decides not to tell the Immigration Service about all of his adventures in Hawaii. He says the first and only time he entered the United States was on April 8, 18, 1912, aboard the SS Carpathia, and he's been there ever since. So our, our final example today is going to be for a deportation record. Um, we're going to stick with the Titanic. Um, I mentioned before that uh, deportation, for deportations, there's normally no notation on a manifest. We have to rely on other resources, usually a newspaper report, uh, family history, or some sort of correspondence that mentions that somebody was deported or sent back to the old country. In this case, we've got a newspaper article from uh, 1912 that mentions that uh, Frank Lafarbe and his son Jules were going to be deported. Um, it says that Jules was deported on the ground that he was likely to become a public charge, which was the most common reasons people were deported, and that um, Frank uh, was deported because he uh, arrived here illegally with a French paramour. Um, that says that I should look for some more records. Uh, in this case, I search Ancestry.com uh, and find no matches uh, for Frank Lafarve. If I did an index search for uh, for Frank, I would come back with this ex uh, deportation file number. Um, and if I did an index search for Jules, his son, I would come back with the, the same file number. Um, so this says that both of their uh, deportation cases were combined into one file. Uh, it's important to note that to get these search results, to get the results for both, you would need to send two requests, one for Frank and one for Jules, because uh, the requests aren't by file number, but they're by the name of the immigrant you search. Uh, so in this file, we learn a little bit more about Frank and why he was going to be deported. Um, this is, in the file, there's a letter from the Immigration Service Inspector in Centerville, Iowa, to Immigration Service Headquarters in Washington, D.C., discussing Frank's case. It, uh, apparently, Frank is um, applying for relief money for families of the Titanic disaster. Uh, his wife and four children were aboard the Titanic, and they perished. But his story begins to raise questions with those uh, organizations. I think it's the Hull House and the Red Cross begin to wonder a little bit about the things that Frank is telling them. So he, uh, they actually contact the Immigration Service and says, you might want to investigate this guy. Their investigation reveals 
that uh, Frank came to the United States under an assumed name with another woman posing as his wife. So he actually abandoned his wife in France, came to the United States with another woman, and was living here with her. When his original wife from France immigrated to the United States to board the Titanic, uh, and unfortunately uh, died on that journey, he then went and tried to collect relief uh, for that original uh, wife. With this information, uh, the Immigration Service uh, takes out a warrant of arrest for Frank um, because uh, he entered under an assumed name and wasn't properly expect, uh, inspected. And they believe also that he's likely to become a public charge. So this is another standard piece of paper you'll find in a, a deportation file. This is the warrant of arrest. It gives the reasons why he should be arrested. Uh, to, to get that warrant, they actually did an investigation. And here they interview Martha DuPont. Martha DuPont is the woman who traveled uh, to the United States with Frank under an assumed name. Uh, she's the French paramour. And uh, they were actually living together in Iowa until Martha ran out of money, and then Frank decided to move on and find somebody else. So she's not too happy with Frank either. Uh, here we find a report from the uh, immigration service officer that performed the investigation. Uh, he actually interviewed Frank, he interviewed Martha DuPont, interviewed lots of the neighbors. Uh, and he finds that his finding, uh, his official finding, is that Frank is a drunkard and near do well. And therefore, he was likely to become a public charge at the time of landing and should be deportable. Um, so he sends this back to Washington, D.C. as his recommendation. Uh, in the course of this investigation, the Immigration Service also tries to find Frank's original arrival record. So the arrival record under the assumed name that he used to get into the country in 1911. Uh, they find it. He entered under the name Henry de Mortier. Uh, March 10, 1911, aboard the Mauritania. So, of course, we could use that information to find uh, Frank's original arrival record. Um, we could search uh, Frank Lafarbe all day long and not come up with any records. Uh, so here's the second standard piece of paper you'll find in a deportation file. This is the warrant of deportation showing the cost for removal. So they've deemed that Frank is deportable. Um, and they give several reasons. First is that he procured a woman for immoral purposes. So because he and Martha DuPont were not married, they shouldn't have been admitted according to the Immigration Service. He's likely to become a public charge. Um, and finally, he entered without inspection. Uh, he was inspected, but he was inspected under assumed named. So uh, that, in that inspection doesn't count um, for Frank. So for all those reasons, he's deemed deportable. Uh, in addition to all that official correspondence and the official investigation, you get some outside correspondence from people who are interested in the case. In this case, I mentioned that the Red Cross and the whole house were involved with Frank. Uh, here's a letter from the Red Cross asking if uh, the Immigration Service can shed some more light on the case. Uh, they would like to know more about Frank before they decide whether or not to give him any public relief. And finally, uh, what you'll see in most deportation files uh, is an execution of deportation. In this case, it shows that Frank was deported on July 31st, 1912, uh, and returned to France. Uh, and this just shows his original manifest, as I mentioned before, that uh, certificate of arrival showing his uh, entry under the name Henry de Mortier uh, lets us find this passenger manifest. So we can see that here he is traveling um, under the name Henry with Martha DuPont, who is traveling under the name Maria de Mortier. So those are my examples for today. Uh, during the presentation, I mentioned several times uh, the USCIS genealogy program and especially the index search. So real quickly, I want to review that program and the services we offer. Uh, the genealogy program offers two services. The first is the index search. Uh, so every time I said I made an index search request, that's what this is. Uh, when somebody files an index search request, we search our historical records indexes. For uh, a single immigrant, you would submit the name of an immigrant, the date of birth, and the place of birth. We would look through our indexes and send you file citations for any files uh, included in the genealogy program related to that specific immigrant. So in this case, uh, you could get back a warrant, or I mean a, an exclusion or deportation file that you could request from the National Archives, or you could get back a naturalization certificate file, which you would request from USCIS itself. Uh, our website tells you exactly which kinds of files are included in the genealogy program. The second service we offer is a records copy request. 
If you have a file number, you can request the copy, you can request the file directly, provided that it's a file included in the genealogy program. They're listed on the bottom right hand side of the slide there. Uh, the fee for the index search is $20. The fee for the records copy request is $20 or $35, depending upon the type of the file. The most common question we get after uh, why can't I search the index myself is who should request an index search? The answer to that question is uh, to ask yourself, do you have a file number? If you have a file number, or if you don't have a file number, then you need to request an index search. We can only provide files by number. If you have a name but no file number, you need to request an index search. If you do have a file number, you can go directly to the uh, records request from USAS or to the National Archives, depending upon the type of the file. So if it's one of the deportation or exclusion files we talked about today, you could request that file directly from the National Archives. On the bottom there, I made a little note that says, uh, however, if you'd like to know if additional files exist, you still may want to make an index search request. A lot of the examples we saw today had not only an exclusion file, but also a, a later related file, such as the visa file or a naturalization file. If you wanted to know of all of the Im immigration service records that existed for that immigrant, you can make an index search request. Uh, as I mentioned, the information we need uh, to make an index search request is first the name. Uh, we let you give uh, alternate spellings, aliases, maiden names, nicknames, anything that will help us find the individual. Second, the date of birth. That can be approximate, but we like at least a year. And finally, the country of birth. Um, that's the required information. Any additional information helps us find the immigrant or helps us narrow, it, narrow him or her down from among several choices. So that includes arrival information, naturalization information, and additional information such as names of spouses and children, date of marriage, places of residence, and military service. All of those things help us find a file, but aren't required. Uh, I mentioned the, the more information you provide, the better the results. That's because lots of people have similar names. So if we did a search for Harry Share, we'd see that there are lots of files um, for somebody named Harry Share. So if we had a, a name of a spouse, a location of residence, a date of military service, any one of those details might help us pick out the correct Harry Shear that you're searching for. Uh, if you need more information about the USCIS genealogy program and the records that are included in it or how the process works, you can go to our website. It's www.uscis.gov slash genealogy. Uh, there we've got a tutorial on exactly how the process works, a list of all of the files that are included, and uh, a gallery of sample files. Um, if you're specifically interested in the deportation and exclusion files that I talked about today, uh, in the genealogy notebook section of our website, we've got two articles that cover this topic in more detail. The first is researching, researching deportation records. It gives you a lot of the information I went over today. And the second is a quick guide to finding INS case and correspondence files related to specific individuals. That gives you more information about searching that index, um, T458 index, and uh, making a genealogy request. And finally, if you want to learn more about our program and stay up to date about the services we offer, you can subscribe to our email notification list. This is at uscis.gov slash genealogy. Um, or if you want to get there through the main website, you find the Family History Research tab, click that, and you'll find a button that says sign up for genealogy notifications. If you sign up for that, we'll send you uh, once or twice a month an update. Normally it includes information about what's new on our website and information about uh, public presentations like this one that we provide. So uh, that's the end of my presentation today, and I think we have time for questions. Yes, thank you, Zach. Uh, we had a lot of great comments from uh, our YouTube audience. Uh, let's clear up some misconceptions about surnames. Uh, one question that came up, th they said, Family lore says our last name was originally very long. On entry into the U.S., agents shortened it to first syllable of the original last name. Was this a practice? Do INS records show the original last name? Uh, this is a question we get quite often. Uh, it's the idea that somebody's name was changed at Ellis Island. A lot of families have that uh, in their lore because um, they do some research and see that 
Uh, in Europe, the name was spelled differently or was much longer, and now it's much shorter. In fact, uh, names were not changed at Ellis Island. When immigrants uh, came to the United States, they provided all of the passenger manifest information to the shipping agent uh, in Europe. That information was entered on the manifest, and then the manifest was presented to uh, officers at, at Ellis Island. Uh, he used it to inspect arriving immigrants. They didn't change uh, names at Ellis Island. Uh, they never took names at Ellis Island. Um, oftentimes, names were changed later, uh, sometimes upon naturalization. Sometimes uh, an assumed name was used and just kept. So all of those reasons um, explain a name change. There was no official practice of changing names at Ellis Island. Thank you for clearing that mystery up. Our next question is about uh, border crossings, of course. My grandfather came to the U.S. from Liverpool to Quebec and entered at Detroit. I checked Detroit and other crossings, but could not find any suggestions on what to try next. So there are, there are border crossing records. It depends upon the date. Anything before the early 1900s, there won't be a file for the Canadian border. But after that, there should be a file. Um, a lot of them have been digitized and put on Ancestry.com, not all of them. Um, if you send an email to our uh, email address, it's on the handout. It's uh, cishistory.library at, at uscis.dhs.gov. Um, I can help you get some more specific information about how to find a border arrival record. Thank you for providing that email address. We will uh, tweet that email address out again if you did not capture that. Our next question, it's about the Titanic, since you mentioned those records. I'm researching a person who missed getting on the Titanic but came weeks later. How and where should I search? I mean, if you're looking for the passenger manifest, you can look uh, on Ancestry.com or another um, online research site that has digitized and put uh, passenger lists online. That's the first place to go. Um, for that era, I know that on Ancestry we've got the arrival manifest for the U.S. and also the outgoing passenger manifests from England. Um, so between those two, you should be able to figure out which ship that person got on and if they eventually made it to the United States. Uh, after that, uh, you should look at the manifest to see if there's any kind of notations like I pointed out today which would point you to other records or else um, look for later naturalization or, or immigration records. Thank you very much. Um, you might have, have covered this, but let's ask again. What types of costs are associated with index search requests in the genealogy program? Okay, the index search request itself is a $20 fee for each name that you, or each immigrant you would like to search. So it's per individual, um, $20. Uh, you can provide one immigrant and uh, alternate names for that immigrant. The important thing that I maybe should have mentioned earlier is in that index search request, the immigrant needs to be deceased. Uh, so when you make your request, you need to provide proof of death or proof that uh, he or she was born 100 or more years ago. Thank you very much. And our last question was more of a question of respect to how much work you've obviously put into this presentation. The, Person asks, I always wonder how long it took for presenters to search, locate, and document these things. Uh, well, if I did this uh, just as uh, you know, a, a single project, it probably would have taken quite a while. Uh, luckily, in my job, I get to look at a lot of different immigration records, a lot of different naturalization records. And when I'm doing that, I find interesting cases, pull them out, set them aside, and then use them for presentations like this. So all of these are files that I've come across in other projects and decided to highlight them today. Thank you, Zach. That uh, concludes our uh, session with you. and appreciate your time. If the speaker did not get to your question, please send an email to the email provided by Zach. Again, we will tweet that email out. I think it's on the handout. And it's on the handout as well. We will now take a short intermission